the agreement went to the uh, Total from France and four U.S. Uh, companies. In a no bid, right? Yeah. Uh, Reese, this is John again. Uh, I, I have a question for you. Uh, it would seem obvious that a lot of uh, our foreign policy in the Middle East is, is being driven uh, by uh, lobbyists who work for the uh, oil industry. And a lot of the uh, foreign policy and a lot of the legislation is simply spoon-fed by these lobbyists. Uh, I also happen to think that, uh, that the Israeli lobby, uh, the American-Israel uh, Public Affairs Committee, also spoon feeds Congress uh, a are, lot. Are you allowed to say Israel lobby on the air? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there an FCC rule about that? Yeah, John doesn't care. <laughs> He's a bad guy. <laughs> I'm a bad guy. I've <laughs> in the last week uh, we've we've received uh, letters that uh, well, uh, one death threat, <laughs> one thinly disguised death threat, and and a few other hate uh, hate letters from uh, a few other admirers All out right. there. I yes, we're going to use the we word use Israel so lobby. Israeli. Bleep. <laughs> Rich, are you going to bleep this out? No, brother. We're right here. We see the guy on the board. He's not bleeping, okay? Uh, All right. Reese, <laughs> talk about that for a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I'm Jewish. I've been, I've covered Israel for six years. I've been all over the Middle East, Lebanon, uh, uh, Syria four times. Uh, as I already mentioned Iraq and Iran. I know the region very well. Um, and interestingly enough, the debate, uh, basically what it comes down to is the Israel lobby in the United States is extremely powerful. Um, and uh, puts, uh, a, has a lot of influence on both Democrat and Republican uh, legislators and presidents and so on, um, to the detriment of the national interests of the United States. Um, and the debate inside the United States about Israeli policies is much narrower than the debate that takes place actually inside Israel, where people are much more critical. Um, you remember the, the two professors here who wrote the book, uh, The Israel Lobby, that yes. is so controversial? They went to Israel, and nobody showed up to their talks, so they had very small turnouts because everybody said, we know that. What's new about that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> this, was old, this was old news. It wasn't like they were picketed or stoned or anything like that. Everybody said, yeah, right, okay, we have to tell us something new. Um, no, so I, what it comes down to is, is that um, anything that the Israeli government in power says or does is automatically supported by the United States. Uh, and it's a very detrimental policy. There's not going to be, uh, you know, the uh, people in the United States tend to see the Iraq war as separate, the Iran war as separate, uh, Lebanon as separate, but in fact people in the Middle East see a lot of it connected to Israeli policy, which is um, that if, um, unless Israel returns the occupied territories and uh, allows a viable Palestinian state, there's going to be continued turmoil in the region. It gives excuses to demagogues and right-wing populists like Ahmadinejad to spew his anti-Jewish rhetoric. Um, but that's not the source of the problem. If Israel were to change its policies, and I've had this discussion with Israeli government officials and, and all kinds of people there, uh, there are people who are willing to genuinely trade land for peace and live side by side with a functioning Palestinian state. It would pull the rug out from under of all of these uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalists and uh, and other demagogues over there, um, and uh, could really lay the basis for an ongoing peace. But that possibility is is just out of the question in the U.S. dialogue uh, if the Israel lobby opposes it. Well, you, uh, you mentioned that you're Jewish, and yet you can have uh, an objective view of uh, of uh, U.S. Israeli uh, relations. Uh, it's interesting to note that in the last week. Uh, Congressman Barney Frank, who was co-sponsor of the most uh, recent uh, legislation before Congress now on uh, on uh, uh, funding, on, you know, for this presidential finding for covert operations in this theater, uh, withdrew as a sponsor for that bill. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it had to do with because there's a bill. It's a supposedly non-binding resolution that would um, call on the U.S. to set up a naval blockade of Iran. I mean, think about that. That is an act of war. Yes, it is. That is an act of war. And they're just tossing it around like, oh, uh, well, the, you know, the Iranians won't mind, or there won't be any kind of reaction to this. I mean, that, you know, a, a good, you know, for your listeners to think about, every time the U.S. or somebody in Congress suggests this particular policy or the Bush administration, ask yourself, what if that happened to us? What would our reaction be? What if somebody in the Iranian parliament introduced a legislation that called for an Iranian naval blockade of Washington, D.C., or New York Harbor yes. or something. 
what would the reaction in the United States be? Well, just look at the uproar that happened over the, the uh, Latino community saying that <laughs> we want our community back and doing their million-person march to try yeah. and get back their land that they owned, you know, two, three hundred years ago. That was, that was like you, you couldn't be American and support yeah, them. Or, or the Dubai ports thing where a, a country, <laughs> another country, you know, uh, anyway, you know, we, we have numerous examples. Mm-hmm. And um, the only argument is, oh, well, we're different because we're a superpower and we're the good guys. So we can do it because we do it with the best of intentions. And, you know, that argument is not true, and it doesn't get you anywhere in the rest of the world. The U.S. has become increasingly isolated, as has Israel, because of their policies. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, we're not just losing our uh, our uh, international uh, leadership position in uh, in uh, the world of diplomacy, but, but in the context of these markets, also as an economic power. Uh, I predict, and uh, I'll make this prediction on the show, that the U.S. dollar will be replaced as the international uh, unit of currency by the euro probably sometime in the next year or two. I do not see our trading partners like Saudi Arabia wanting to accept dollars for oil for very much longer. Yeah, that's the trend. More and more of the uh, uh, currency deals are going on in euros now. Did you know? I mean, the drug dealers certainly uh, uh, <laughs> like the, the, you know, because you can get a 500 euro note. So when you ship those container loads of cash, yes, it's, it takes up much less room. Well, they use a different kind of green here in Mendocino County, actually. <laughs> uh, well, see, yeah, there you go. So there, I'm sure people have maybe who would like to call in with their direct experience of using euros instead of dollars. But. <laughs> Before we let you go, uh, just follow up very quickly on Seymour Hersh's article in the New Yorker about uh, US, U.S. covert operations yeah. in Iran, or, or as I like to call it, U.S.-sponsored terrorism in Iran. Yeah, I mean, if the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is doing to Iran exactly what it accuses Iran of doing in Iraq. That is, it's funding and um, providing arms to uh, dissident groups uh, to carry out terrorist attacks against the Iranian government. I personally visited northern Iraq. I went high up into the Kandil Mountains in the Kurdish region of Iraq, to meet with Iranian Kurds who are carrying out U.S.-sponsored uh, attacks on uh, Iran. Uh, in Khuzestan, which is the Arab part of Iran, uh, there were several attacks, uh, blowing up of civilian office buildings, uh, bombs in the streets. In the Baluchi area, which is over by Pakistan, uh, ABC News reported on a group that is um, funded by the U.S. to uh, blew up a busload of Revolutionary Guards and killed several civilians. Um, and the guy leading that group, it's called John Dala, is a former leader of the Taliban. So the U.S. is making these alliances with these the worst of the worst, in, in a number of cases, fundamentalist, right-wing, Sunni uh, l- religious fanatics, Taliban types, to ally with them against Iran. And that's a very... Because these guys have no do not support the United States. They don't support democracy. It's an opportunistic alliance in which they will turn around and bite the U.S. at right. the first opportunity. They're gangsters. But yeah. that's nothing new. Yeah, this is what the U.S. did in <laughs> Afghanistan in the 1980s when yeah. the, during the Soviet occupation. And that's why we have al-Qaeda and uh, Osama bin Laden and those folks today. And the U.S. had worked with them quite closely back in the 80s. Well, it's, it's, it's karma, isn't it? Reese, I want to thank you for being a guest on our show. Uh, we have one more guest behind you, and I, I want to be able to squeeze him in. I could uh, listen to you for uh, for hours. Um, keep up the good fight, brother. Uh, uh, thank you. Go to, go to Amazon, buy the book, uh, go to your local bookstore. 